questions on this one. So we start off to go through and name. What do we have? Potassium, chloride, oxygen. Potassium. Then we have the complex ion, ClO2. So you would need to know how to name that one. It is named chlorite. I would love to tell you there was a way to actually mnemonic device that stuff, but the only reason I know it is because I had to memorize it to teach this class, <laughs> quite frankly. All right. um, next one down. Ammonium, complex ion. Not to be confused with ammonia. Ammonia, ammonium, two different things. Followed by sulfate. And this would get back to Caleb's question. came up yesterday. How would you go through a name and deal with your Roman numerals and predicting what stuff should show up? Okay. What's the name for this compound? We've got chromium. And the other one is become nitride, not nitrogen. Whoops, as I start to spell nitrogen. Nitride, which uh, from what I've overheard, Google comes back and tells you that that's the answer, and Google would be wrong. That is not the correct answer. What is wrong with this name? We need to specify the charge on chromium. Okay. Why do we need to know the charge on chromium? Okay. Heard a couple different answers in there. To make it neutral, okay, well, if it was chromium-2 or chromium-3, nitride would have been right out, of the back, right out of the gate balances. Why do I need to bring in all these other numbers? Okay. Another suggestion I heard was transition elements. Okay. Not a bad guess. And probably, what is that, 85% of the cases you'd be right, except zinc, cadmium, and silver, you don't specify the charge on. Okay. So how do we know that we need to specify the charge? It's not a pleasant rule. Nope. If you have the charge memorized, the reason you memorized it is because there is only that charge, which means no need to... Uh, no need to specify it because there's only one charge. The reason we have to specify it for chromium is that chromium can hold a bunch of different charges. So if we just say chromium nitride, we don't know how many chromiums are necessary to balance out the nitrides or the nitrogens because I don't know the charge on the chromium. So the name <coughs> must include the charge. How are we going to determine what that charge is? We already heard a couple of people shout out that we need to do it Roman numerals. Cool, so there's Roman numerals. What should I put in the Roman numerals? Three, two, two. Okay. Lots of threes and twos. The twos officially are correct. Where did you get the three from? For those of you who said three. Okay. The three right there. Okay. Yeah, that's a reasonable guess. There's a three there, so let's put a three in, in our formula. What does the three in our formula mean? <coughs> there are three chromium atoms in that compound. What does the number mean in the parentheses? <coughs> it is the charge. I'll just stop walking through there. Okay. It is the charge. Those things mean different things. Okay. So we need to come up with a way to specify what the charge is and where we can find it. Every time we put together a compound, what should the overall charge be? Zero. Zero. So our work for this question would be looking at the charge from our chromium, and we add up the charge from our nitrogen, and this then must equal zero. Nice little simple formula. Charge from chromium, charge on nitrogen must equal zero. There's an extra little caveat to this. How many chromiums are there? Three. So I have to add the charge of every single chromium atom in there, which really means I'm looking at three times the charge on chromium, and I'm looking at 
two times the charge on nitrogen. The whole point was to specify the charge on the chromium, so clearly that is unknown. Everybody okay with that? How do we know the charge on nitrogen then to be able to solve this? That's one you're supposed to have memorized. Right? Nitrogen's charge is a negative 3. What does x have to equal for this equation to be true? x must equal a positive 2. What did we say x was? Don't tell me plus 2. The charge on chromium. Where do we specify the charge on chromium? In the Roman numerals for our formula. Okay. I know your question was two days ago, but does that now answer your question? <laughs> yes, that's the best way to answer questions. Wait two days. You'll forget what the question was, and I'm perfectly right. Okay. It's going to take practice to deal with these. You have to go through and continue to reiterate and go through the rules until you've got them nailed down. Okay. There are lots of things you need to memorize to go through and deal with nomenclature. Okay. Last naming compound. Uh, in fact, actually, I'm going to switch that up. How do we name this one? It's carbon and and you said chloride, right? Or did you say chlorate? Okay. Chlorate, remember the T means complex ion. Chlorine. <laughs> chlorine is not with oxygen. We just have four chlorine atoms, so we'll refer to it as chloride. How do we specify the charge on our carbon? We don't specify the charge on the carbon. Why? Doesn't it? No. Take a look at, at this line here. Everything above this line has a particular characteristic. Everything below that line has a different well, characteristic. Carbon. Above that line, we are bonding a metal to a non-metal. Below that line, we are bonding non-metal to non-metal. Is that going to change the rules? Yes. Where do we specify the charge in non-metal to non-metal? We don't. Okay. So how do we know how much of each of those elements are present if I don't look at the charge? I have to change the name to specify the amount of each of those elements. So this becomes <coughs> carbon tetrachloride, because tetra is, say, Greek for four. So when you go through to do nomenclature, it breaks up into a lot of different subcategories. Arguably the hardest nomenclature system are ionic compounds, where it's a metal and a nonmetal. Those are where you have a lot of rules. You've got to balance out charge. You've got to specify charge, all sorts of nasty stuff. Most people don't care about the nomenclature of our nonmetals to nonmetals because our name literally tells us how much of each of those elements are present. Okay? Practice, practice, practice. Go back to the lab that you're doing in two weeks. Okay? Start working those examples or finish working th those examples. If you finish that before the exam, you should do very well when it comes to nomenclature on the exam. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. This last part came up. Yeah. Don't you like that? Look at that. What kind of a jerk instructor do you have? Okay. Multiple choice. The reason why I'm bringing this question in comes back to that whole density question that we looked at last time that everybody was so unhappy with. We'll say, well, the answer is 0.7 or 0.86 and 0.72 is closer. You guys remember that one? Okay. How could you possibly forget that? Okay. This is going to come back to analyzing the data that you are given. 
Which of the following is the number that comes next in the sequence? Four. A lot of people said four. Anybody come up with a different answer? Really? Nobody? Does that mean the fours are wrong? Nobody? <laughs> is it two? Majority ruled. It's going to be two. Isn't okay. it? So, just because I read some of the, the explanations, they explain your choice. The, probably the most likely answer I'm going to get here is the answer is D4 because I can count. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. I would make the argument that the answer is E. Your argument would be wrong. <laughs> oh, because one plus, uh, one plus two is three, and two plus three is five. Wow. <laughs> okay. Based on the evidence given, you have to draw a conclusion. Whether you are right or wrong is kind of irrelevant to a general question. Whether you are right or wrong is then going to come down to the quality of the question asked. You must answer given the data provided. The data provided leads you potentially to answer four. Why is this question then a horrible question? Multiple answer choices can lead you to, that, to a different or a correct answer for completing that. Right? So it is a horrible question, and it should never show up on an exam. If we go back to that previous example of looking at the densities, okay, you have to ignore the fact that you were given that density. If we said we aren't given that density, how would we predict what that number would be? We predict based on looking at the trends around it. Okay? So what could we add to this to help us figure out that 5 is the answer I'm looking for? Okay, now does 4 make sense in that pattern? No, it doesn't make sense. So by providing that extra information, I've now clarified the question that only one answer is valid. You have to interpret the information given. Okay, this is what science is trying to do. We look at the information, we try to make a prediction, and then we go back and see if we were right or wrong. When it comes to the exam, I'm not expecting you to do science. I'm expecting you to get the answer right. So the questions that you will see have exactly one answer. The instant it doesn't have one answer, what is now your responsibility as a student to do? Come back and politely call BS on the question that I asked. Okay. This isn't just my class. This is education in general. If the question is written poorly, you need to make sure that your instructor knows that it's written poorly, okay? and that you need to be graded for accordingly. Okay? Instructors hate when students know this, because that makes life more difficult as an instructor, because you have to write intelligent questions. Okay? Oh, I did it again. i got to stop moving through there. Okay? Get the idea of what we're getting at with the previous question. And you get the idea of what we can do here to fix that. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. We're at least somewhat satisfied with what we can expect on an exam. Is that somewhat satisfied? OK. I got one head shake. That's good enough. At least it was in the affirmative. OK. So now we'll move on. Our energy levels. <clears throat> so remember what we talked about was Bohr's discovery or analysis of our atomic line spectra. We took an element, we put it in a glass tube, we hit it with a ton of electricity, it then emitted that energy back out as light, and when we looked at that light through a prism, we noticed lines, distinct lines, not broad, continuous lines, okay? Discrete energy levels. Bohr took that to mean that the electrons can only exist in distinct or at distinct energy levels. So if we go through and look at this, we've got our nucleus in the middle, which I'll show as a nice red dot, and then we radiate outwards from there the distinct energy levels where our electrons can exist. Okay, so if we looked at, say, hydrogen, hydrogen has exactly how many electrons as an atom? 
one. Where would we expect to find that one electron? Okay, the first shell. Why? Well, that's knowing too much information. We call it first for a reason, right? And why do we call it first? Yeah, this is the first one. Don't define with, a de with the words of the, the question that we're asking. That doesn't work. All chemistry, all life strives for neutrality. The charge on an electron is negative. Is that neutral? What is the charge on a proton? Positive. Is that neutral? No. How can we neutralize those individual charges? Put those two as close as possible to each other as we can. Okay. We'll have to put them close enough to each other that they can interact, okay. but not annihilate. <clears throat> Why don't they annihilate? Uh, talk to your philosophy instructor. Okay. So we have our electron as close as possible to the nucleus, because the closer it is to the nucleus, the more those charges interact, and they can cancel out the charge. What happens if I take that electron and move it further from the nucleus? Imbalanced. It's imbalanced. As soon as it is imbalanced, it is now at a high energy state. And at that high energy state, what does our molecule or our atom want to do? Relieve that high energy by going back to our ground state, our lowest energy state. So if we take a look at our hydrogen, there's our happy little hydrogen with an electron sitting in that lowest, whoops, I can count. I didn't see that that was the one. Give me some credit. <clears throat> we have our electron in the lowest energy, closest to the nucleus as possible, sitting just chilling all by itself. Then Bohr or some other scientist comes along and juices it with a bunch of electric current. Well, electric current is energy. So what is that electron going to do? It's going to go up to a higher energy level. Okay. What higher energy level do you want to move it to? It's your choice. Two. Way to be creative. OK. <laughs> that sounded kind of mean. I apologize. <laughs> so we gave it a bunch of extra electrons. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> I actually didn't hear what you said. We're now up at this higher energy state. So if we look at our atom now, our electron is now up there in our second energy level. It is now higher in energy. It doesn't want to be high in energy. So what does it do? It has to go back down to the ground state. So typically, we show a nice little wavy line. Or actually, we show that as a straight line, where it's going back down to that ground state energy. We started at a high energy, and we ended at a low energy. In this description, what happened to the energy difference? So far, we've destroyed it. Okay. We started high, we ended low. We start with 100, we end with 50. There is 50 energy units that have now somehow disappeared in our picture. Can we create or destroy energy? No. Einstein told us not to. Okay, so the energy is not destroyed. What happened to it? Okay. It had to be released as some alternate form of energy. That alternate form of energy is our electromagnetic spectrum. And depending on the energy difference, that happens to match the energy for visible light. And we can now see a light emission. The energy of that light will correspond to what? Okay, it'll give us a color. What else is it going to correspond to? The exact energy difference between those orbitals. Okay. Let's say there were no orbitals. When it absorbs energy, where does the electron go? wherever it wants, which then means when it relaxes back down, the difference in energy is now going to be whatever it wants, which means when we look at our atomic line spectrum, what are we going to see? 
a continuous spectrum of all of the possible energies. Is that what we end up seeing? No, we see these lines okay, that correspond to a very particular energy level. <coughs> That very particular energy level then means that our electron cannot exist wherever the heck it wants. It has to exist at very particular energy levels. That's atomic theory for our electrons. This is what Bohr went through and said. Depending on where our energy levels are, we'll get varying energies of light. So if we take a look at the diagram as shown, You'll notice that they've added some other lines over the top. Uh, maybe erasing that was a bad idea. Oh, that was definitely the wrong idea. When we do the jump from energy level 2, from energy level 5 to energy level 2, is that a big energy difference or a small energy difference? Okay, big in comparison to what? Okay, how about from the 4 to 2 or from the... 3 to 2. Okay. So our 5 to 2 releases more energy than the jump from the 4 to 2. What color light would I expect to be closer to? Violet light because violet light has higher energy. Okay. If that one's violet, what do we expect the 4 to 2 to be? somewhere at a lower energy from violet, which then really gives us the entire color choice spectrum, we end up with blue. The next one we end up with red. Okay. That's what's happening when we look at our atomic line spectrum. We're just looking at our electrons jumping between the individual energy levels, ultimately from our high energy state to a low energy state. You'll notice that we're jumping from five to where? Two. To two. Why did we not jump to one? Is that jump not allowed? Where did our hydrogen electron start? In one. So why could we not jump from five to one? Kind of a trick question. We can jump from five to one. That is perfectly valid. Is that jump higher or lower in energy than five to two? Higher in energy. If we go higher in energy than purple, what visible light do we see? We don't see anything. We can't see ultraviolet light. It's outside of the visible light spectrum. So the transitions we're seeing for our atomic line spectrum just happen to be the transitions that correspond to visible energy differences. All of the other transitions are perfectly valid. They just happen to transition in a spectrum or part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we cannot see. Okay. Questions? Let's put it this way. If you thought that was hard, it really only gets harder. Why do you have to say that? Because okay. I want questions now, not coming back to this five slides later. Uh, I have a question. So um, it will be the only three colors that we're going to be able to see? When we look at four hydrogen, <laughs> mm -hmm. we only detect three colors. We see three lines. Okay. All the other energy, possible energy transitions do not correspond to light in the visible spectrum. So we can't see those transitions. The only transitions we can see are from 5 to 2, 4 to 2, and th 3 to 2. Should you memorize those numbers? Yeah. Don't. That's a bad idea. You don't want to do that. Because what happens when we change elements? What happens when we go to helium? We have a different number of protons and a different number of electrons. Are those electrons, I do see you, are those electrons going to affect each other's energy? Yep. yep. Are changing the number of protons going to affect the attractive force of the nucleus on the electrons? Yep. yep. Which means where are the energy levels for each of the orbitals going to be? Different. Which means what happens to the atomic line spectrum? Different. It's different for every single element much the same as a fingerprint is different for every single person. For those of you potentially interested in astronomy, we use atomic line spectra to predict what elements are available in different parts of the far galaxy. Okay. Yes? So if you give an electric charge, 
charge, then the electron will go up. When that electron charge goes away, it releases energy and it goes back down? Yep. And that release of energy in this case happens to be as visible light for the 5 to 2, 4 to 2, and 3 to 2 for hydrogen. Yes? So 5 to 1 does happen, but we just can't see it. 5 to 1 happens. 5 to 1 is a bigger jump or a smaller jump than 5 to 2. It's a bigger jump, which means the energy is? Bigger. What energy is, or what visible light is higher in energy than violet? No visible light. There is no visible light higher in energy than violet. It moves into ultraviolet, which we can't see. It's still part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's just not a part that we can see. If we were to go from like 3 to 1, would it still be blue? If we jump from 3 to 1, okay. Now we're trying to go through and play a matching game of the exact distances between each of those orbitals. Is 3 to 1 similar to 4 to 2? Maybe. Okay. I can tell you right now, no. How do I know the answer is no? In the atomic line spectrum, how many lines do we see? Three, which correspond to five to two, four to two, three to two. If the three to one jump happened to correspond to visible light, I'd see that line in the atomic line spectrum. I don't. So I know that whatever that jump is, it's either too high or too low for me to pick up in the visible spectrum. Is that only in the case for hydrogen? That is only the case for hydrogen, yep. But that 3 to 1 jump, would it be the same color as 4 to 2? So that's what she just asked. The 3 to 1, that 3 to 1 jump, if we look at that distance, you're trying to say, well, the 3 to 1 is roughly the same as the 4 to 2. But because there's not energy, there's, there's when not energy. When we look energy, at energy. hydrogen, nope, because it's all about the difference, the raw difference in energy. When we look at hydrogen's atomic line spectrum, do we see another line that would correspond to the 3 to 1? So does the 3 to 1 transition give us visible light? No. So what you're trying to do is measure off of these lines that the textbook has drawn. Has anybody found a typo in the textbook before? Any textbook? Yeah. Typos happen all the time. Here, you're looking at hardcore quantum physics to explain the exact energy levels of each of those lines. You can't expect the textbook author to spell right. I'm pretty sure they can't understand the quantum physics to put those levels at the proper level. Okay. Yeah? So the specific numbers, which is why I said don't memorize these, the specific numbers come from the hardcore quantum physics calculations of the different energy levels. And what we can do is once we know that energy level, we can look at the differences and say, what energy did that correspond to? Oh, that was blue. There's my line. Okay. But you'd have to do the physics for it. So the only visible lights are violet, green, and red? For hydrogen, violet, blue, green, and red. What's the most amount of shells you can have? Interesting question. We'll get to that later. Okay. The quick answer. <laughs> I actually didn't hear that. The quick answer. I don't know what's happening. You guys are either mumbling or I'm going deaf. Um, the quick answer from what we've discovered, seven. There are seven energy levels. Okay. Could we go more than that? Yes. Theoretically, it's infinite we could go on for an infinite amount of energy levels. So what happens if we switch to different elements? You get different atomic line spectrum. So for helium, there are seven lines. One, two, did I count that right? Oh, there's eight. OK, I lied. There's eight lines for helium. Do you have to memorize it? No. What do you have to acknowledge and remember from this section? Atomic line spectrum correspond to the fingerprint for the atom. Okay. It is also what gives us the evidence to suggest we have atomic orbitals or electron orbitals. Okay. Without atomic line spectrum, we don't have the idea for our energy levels. Yes? Oh, NM. 
nanometers. It's a distance. Okay, remember wavelength was the point from max to max. A nanometer is then a really small meter. Yes? For um, helium and hydrogen, they're at the top, so they only have the one, two um, electrons. So when they just increase over, they're just going further out, just those. We'll talk about that right here. So Bohr discovered our main energy level. Okay. So what we start with, okay, and I should have gone a little, uh, actually, how did I do this? Uh, okay, I'm going to skip here a little bit. And a little bit more. I want to make sure I know what my drawing was trying to show. We will start with our nucleus all the way down at the very, very bottom. Okay. After that, we'll move up to our first energy level. What do we want to call our first energy level? One. 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 Super creative. Before we look at the other energy levels, I wasn't blaming you for being creative. <laughs> blaming? <laughs> what happens if we move that electron really, really far away from the nucleus? Is it attached to the nucleus anymore? No. No longer interacting. Okay. So where do we have the it's interacting to it's not interacting? That's kind of some arbitrary distance. That line we will establish is what's called the vacuum. Uh, let's just say BAC. No, it's BAC for vacuum. Okay. So that means our electron has now gotten so far away from the nucleus, it is no longer attached, no longer attracted to the atom. That is our maximal energy level. We cannot go any higher than that. Because we go higher than that, you're not attached to the nucleus anymore. Okay. So what happens when we move to our next energy level? Let's draw the next energy level. Where would you put it? Right above the one. Put it above the one. Where do you draw that? Or what would we call that one? Two. Two. Really creative again. Again, not blame. What about the next one? Next one. Next one. Next one. What ends up happening? They get closer and closer to each other. Why? If they go into the vacuum, they're no longer attached. So our energy levels will eventually get closer and closer. We can theoretically break that distance down for an infinite amount of times. Okay. But then what ends up happening to be the difference in energy between each of those orbitals? Decreasingly small so that they effectively become the same orbital. Okay. How far could we go? It ends up coming out to only seven. So here's our first awesome tail of our periodic table. How many, excuse me, rows, so rows run horizontally, columns run vertically. How many rows on the periodic table? So there's really only two numbers you should be giving me here, guys. One, two, three, four, right? How many boxes do we have down? So here's the interesting question. Some people said nine. We have 8, 9 here, right? But remember, where are these two rows? They're inside the one above. How many rows do we have? 7. How many energy levels do we have? 7. Could we do 8? Yes. But 8 is so large, we haven't even made that element yet. Okay. Could we do 9? Yes. That's even further on down the road. Okay. So we end up with these energy levels that our periodic table tells us. Okay? So all you have to be able to do is count down from the top. Our first energy level is at hydrogen. Second energy level starts with lithium. Fifth energy level starts with Ooh, gotcha. hmm. Oh, yeah, that was kind of mean. <laughs> the element RB, rubidium. rubidium. So all you're doing is counting the rows, and that tells you the energy level. Okay. 
So now let's think about our electron homes. We need to put electrons into these energy levels. Okay. Well, what charge is an electron? Negative. negative. What happens when I get a negative near another negative? They push, back out. they push away from each other. So if I'm going to put electrons into these homes, more than likely I would expect, or my initial guess would be to put an electron in. Actually, let's remove that arrow. Where would I put the next electron? Why do I have to go above it? The electrons would repel each other. They don't want to be near each other, so I can only put one electron in. How many energy levels do we have here? Seven, Seven which means how many electrons can we possibly have in an element? Seven. Seven. Does that match our periodic table? No. We moved to just neon. How many electrons does a neon atom have? Neon? 10, because we have to balance out the 10 protons, our theory is already falling apart. Well, that kind of sucks. Okay? So we add an extra kind of caveat to this. Okay? Our electrons have a spin associated with them. When those spins are in opposite directions, they don't interact with each other. So we have spin up and we have spin down, which means in that very first energy level, how many electrons can I put in? Two. So the next one I'd have? Two. two. And the next one? Two. two. Cool, I've got more electrons I can put in now. Does this explain my periodic table? No, no I've still got problems. Okay. So we still have to keep refining and refining. And what we end up noticing is that while we can put two electrons into a single home, every time we move up in an energy level, we build more homes. At the first energy level, we're going to have exactly one home. Because first energy. When we go up to the second energy level, we will have <coughs> two homes. Third energy level, three homes. Sixth energy level, six homes. We did not fall into that trap again. Okay. So we end up adding on our different levels of homes. Okay. So now let's go through and look at it. Start with two electrons. Two electrons, two, 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 two. How many electrons would we be able to put into our structure? Can anybody do that math that fast? Okay, I was just curious. Uh, so it's changing around. Will we have enough electrons to account for our periodic table? Sure. No. Still doesn't work. We're still short by a significant amount. This description will still probably only get us up to element 50. We've got another 50 elements that we've got to take care of. So somehow or another, we have to continue to resolve this issue. Okay. This gets resolved by looking at now our type of home. Our homes are better referenced as orbitals. If we're at the first energy level, we have one type of home. What is the shape for that one type of home? For those of you that read the chapter. A sphere. Okay. When we move up to the second energy level, we will repeat that home because we made it once. We might as well repeat it. So I go up to the second energy level, and I've got two different types of homes. One of them will be a sphere. The other one will be, uh, if it's another sphere, then it looks exactly the same. I can't tell the difference between them. Okay. What happens if we move up to the third energy level? The first type we'll have will be a sphere. The next type? Uh, I understand what you're saying by two spheres, but those aren't spheres. <laughs> the third energy level, or the third type? Okay. So now we've got these variety of shapes. If we move up to the fourth energy level, we'll end up adding another type of shape into this. So how is this important? Let's go back and look at our orbital type to begin with. 
what we're now going to introduce is this new concept of the orbital orientation. So let's start with our first shape, that sphere, and now I'm going to rotate it. What would I draw? A sphere. Could you tell I rotated it? No. no. How many orientations are possible for a sphere? One. One unique one. There's an infinite ways we can spin it, okay? But they, oh man, God, it's all getting worse. Stand over here, you stupid. They're all, no. Uh, there's only one unique type of orientation for a sphere. When we move up to the second energy level, our first orbital type will still be a sphere. How many possible orientations are there for that sphere? Still, only one. We move up to the next shape, which is referred to dumbbell. like a dumbbell. Okay? Chemists are weird. Okay? <laughs> we have the dumbbell shape. If I rotate the dumbbell, will you know that it was rotated? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now we run into the possible ways that you can change that orientation. Right, which becomes a whole nother mess, so you just kind of have to take my word for it. We end up with three possible orientations. We have one on the x-axis, one on the y-axis, and the last one on the z-axis coming in and out of the board at you. Okay. We have three possible orientations for that type of orbital. If we move all the way up to our third energy level, we've got our, our sphere, our dumbbell, and then we have the clover leaf. When it comes to the clover leaf, we end up finding that there are five orientations. Oh, that's a bit odd. It didn't just go up plus one each time, uh, or plus two. Uh, it went up plus two each time. How could we possibly have this information memorized? I mean, that's a lot of freaking effort and work that goes into this. Well, let's go back to our idea of adding electrons and building our elements. Okay? If we go all the way back to our beginning here, and actually, I'm going to release those pictures, see if it showed up. Come on. Okay, I didn't draw it. Our sphere... We had one orientation. The dumbbell, we had three possible orientations. We will show that by using three lines. Our line is now going to represent the location for where our electrons can exist. If we move up to the third energy level, we start with our sphere, which has one orientation. The next one up would be the three orientations. The next one up would be five orientations. A one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Let's start to build. Hydrogen has exactly how many electrons? One. one electron. Where would that one electron go? The very first energy level. Let's name that energy level. This was which energy level? One. What type of orbital was it? Sphere. One sphere takes too many words. One S. Why do we pick S? Sphere begins with S. Super creative. How many electrons went into that 1s orbital? What I've now described is the electrons for hydrogen. Not only the electrons for hydrogen, but the orientation and the configuration for the electrons for hydrogen, where they're all located. So I now have the electron configuration for hydrogen. 1s1, without all the fancy drawings and lines. Move to helium, what do we get? We would get two electrons. Where do those two electrons need to go? Our first energy level. So our electron configuration for helium would become 1s2. The upper right-hand corner is counting the electrons that went into that orbital. Yes? Why are there two electrons here now? Because we've moved to helium. 
Where should we put our electrons? Lowest energy or highest energy? Lowest energy. So we'll always go lowest energy first. Okay. Once I've done hydrogen, I have one electron in the 1s. Where should helium's next electron go? Where's the next lowest energy? Still the 1s. To put it in the 2s, I have to go up in energy. How many electrons do we say we could fit in an individual orbital? Two, because of their spins. They're spinning opposite directions. So each orbital can only hold two electrons. Okay. What happens when we move to lithium? We've got three electrons. Where's the first electron of lithium go? The 1s orbital. The second electron. The second one in there. Third one. Now we'll move up to our 2s orbital. Moving on up. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, not really. <laughs> <coughs> Move to beryllium. What do you mean four? It has four electrons, yeah. Where do they go? Two in the first. Two in the first. Two in the second. And we end up with 2s2. What's our next element? Mm, next element, boron with five electrons. Where does its electron go? Two in the first. Two in the second. What do you mean one in the third? So up here? Where does that next electron go? There's our word. It goes into the two dumbbell shape. Dumbbell shape is an awful name. So what do we end up calling it? P. P. Why? Anybody speak German? Dumbbell in German starts with P. <laughs> don't, don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure it's not true. Carbon. Six total electrons. Where its electrons go? 1s2, 2s2, and we'll end up with 2p2. So now comes a fun question. Since I'm drawing it in, where do I put that second electron? So there's two next to it. We'll call it red next to it, and we'll call it blue next to it. What happens when an electron gets near an electron? They push away from each other. The only reason we put our electrons in the next orbital is because, or keep it in the same orbital, is because the next orbital is too high in energy. When we look at this configuration for carbon, there's an electron there. I am allowed to pair as long as there's not, or the, as long as the next orbital is higher in energy. Where is the next available orbital? Same energy. What does that mean? Blue is the answer. This is interesting. I half fill orbitals first. Could I change the name of this to account for that? Yeah, if I really wanted to, I could call them PX and PY and PZ. Do you want to do that? No, thank you. So we'll call it 2P2. Next electron for nitrogen. Yeah, so where do those electrons go? 1s2, 2s2. Our name, good fix, becomes 2p3. Where do we draw that electron? In the third orbital. The exponent was the 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 1, 2. The exponent is the number of electrons. Okay. One more time, can you explain why it didn't, why it didn't go up? Just so instead of why we don't why jump we up to the... Up. Okay, so the reason why we don't, or why we go over as opposed to in the same location, same orbital. Oh, because the negatives. Okay. The negatives repel. Yep. <laughs> yep. So why don't those two negatives repel those two? They do repel, 
But what happens? Their one other option is higher in energy. So it would rather pair than jump to a higher energy state. When we looked at carbon, we had to add that sec second electron. Why did it go to a new orbital as opposed to pairing? Well, where's the next orbital? Exact same energy level. Okay. So the only reason we pair is if there's not an equal or lower energy orbital to go into. Okay. So if we look back through this, hydrogen, its last electron was where? 1s. Helium was 1s. Hydrogen and helium are a little bit sketchy, so let's move to lithium. Lithium, where's its last electron? 2s. So the second energy level, lithium's in what row? Hmm, second. What was the last electron for beryllium? Where did it go? 2s. Huh. Beryllium's in the second row. Interesting. What happens with boron? Second row, second energy level, but we now called it P. Why would we call it P? Well, let's look at the periodic table. Is boron immediately next to beryllium? No, it's in a separate section of the periodic table. That separate section of the periodic table is known as the P block because the outermost electrons for elements found in that section are found in p orbitals. Where's the outermost electron for calcium? What's the symbol for calcium? <coughs> Ca. <laughs> Just clarifying here. Where's Ca? It is in the one, two, three, fourth energy level. Okay, is it in the P block? No. That was a whole separate section. So I didn't say what the block for lithium and beryllium was. Those both had electrons in the S orbital. Guess what those two columns collectively are known as? The S block. The outermost electron for calcium is the 4S orbital. 4S2 if we're going to jump to the full-on electron configuration. What orbital contains the outermost electron for bromine? Symbol, Br. For those of you tracking down numbers, that's 35. Which energy level is that? Our fourth, because that is the fourth row. Where is bromine found? In the P block. Which column of the P block is bromine found in? The fifth column. So when we fill up bromine's electron configuration, its last electron will have the identity 4P5. You all played that battleship game? Yeah. Guess what periodic table is? A massive battleship game. It makes it a lot easier to learn. <laughs> it's amazing the information stashed within the periodic table. As we go up in complexity, we move to higher energy levels, we start introducing new orbital types, which then means new orbital orientations. We started with our electron spin to explain fitting two electrons into an individual orbital. But the electron spin would be our last and final value for this. The whole point of orbitals is just coming up where the electrons live. Everyone goes, oh, that's way too difficult. What's your home address? Don't shout out your home address. <laughs> but think about your home address. Do you have that memorized? Yeah. What is your home address? <laughs> what does your home address represent? Where you live. You have a street. You have the number on that street. You have the city. You have the state. Each of those correspond to the varying levels of information with our orbital diagram. Our energy level is the state that we're located in. The orbital type, our city. Our orbital orientation, the street. The electron spin, the actual number on that street. Okay. 
our orbital picture and representation of where our orbitals are located is vastly simpler, vastly more simple, vastly more simple than your address. Okay? Think of it in that context, and that can help. Okay? Symbols that you need to know. We talked about what this, the S shape looked like. That was our sphere, which gave us only one possible orientation. The next type ends up being the P type, which shows up at first for which energy level? The second energy level. Okay. Cannot show up in the first energy level because the first energy level has only one type. It can only be the S. The P orbital has, or the dumbbell shape we've called the P orbital. So you are responsible for tying these shapes, what they look like, so we would call it a sphere, and call it an S. The next one we refer to as a dumbbell, and we call it P. Did anybody actually look up the German word for dumbbell? I'm just curious. Why did you have to use German? Why couldn't you say D? Why did you have to use German? About 20 to 50 years ago, to get a PhD in chemistry, what did you also have to be able to do? Fluent in German. Okay. A lot of science came out of Germany. Okay. The last one we refer to as the clover leaf, and we refer to that one as the D orbital. Wow. I tried. I tried. I tried. All right. So you are responsible for acknowledging those shapes to those individual symbols. Okay. We've already identified on our periodic table different locations for these. How many electrons fit into the S-type orbital? Two. Two. How many columns were there in the S-block? Two. Two. P-type orbitals. This is where we've got to be careful. The P-type can fit how many electrons? Six. Six because there's three orientations. How many columns in the P block? Six. Six. The D type orbitals can fit how many electrons? Ten. Ten. How would you figure that out? The Count the columns in the D block. Where's the D block? The big section in the middle, section in the middle known as our transition elements. Those are the D block. How many columns? Ten. ten. They fit ten electrons. How many orbitals in the D orbitals? Five. Five, because each orbital holds two electrons. Is the, are there more orbitals or more types of orbitals? Yes. The next one is known as the F orbital, which hopefully you'll never see as a letter grade. You have your F orbitals. How many electrons fit into the F type orbitals? Twelve. How'd you come up with twelve? Uh, yeah. And since you're staring right at me, that's I'm gonna keep that focus. <laughs> Where'd you come up with fourteen? <laughs> What's that? No, come on. The information is given to you. It's staring you in the face on the periodic table. The S block had two electrons because two columns. The P block had Six electrons because? Six columns. six columns. The D block had 10 electrons because there are 10 columns. The F block, you should be able to count. The space is taken up. Which is how many columns? 14. 14. The F block holds 14 electrons. How many types of orbitals or orientations are there for the F elements? Seven. Okay. The periodic table has that information. So this is one of those things where, oh, there's so much to memorize. It's given to you. It's staring you in the face. You do have to be able to interpret it. Work on that interpretation, getting used to it. If you spend your time to memorize these numbers, you are wasting your time. Use the periodic table. Okay? And if you think this is ridiculous, how much I'm pointing at the periodic table and how, telling you how useful it is, it only keeps getting better or worse, I guess, as your perspective from here. 
because I will keep pointing to the periodic table and keep telling you what other information is stored within it. There is tons of information up there. It is your job to be able to interpret and find it. Okay. So our orientations, we had three orientations for our P. Okay. Notice I jumped up here to the, actually, D, our possible orientations for the D orbitals. You'll notice that four of them all just look like variations of moving the orbital off of axis. And the last one certainly doesn't look like an orientation change. The orientation, there's a very good reason I put it in quotes, because it's not true. It is the complex, complex mathematical relationship coming out of quantum physics to solve for the probability of finding an electron in a particular shape. Meaning, if I look at my s orbital, let's pick the easiest one, let's draw an electron. Would I expect to find an electron in the one s orbital, if that's my, our three s orbital, does it make sense to find the electron there as that red dot? Not always. Not always is a good point. Is it likely to be found within that shape? 95% probability. 95% of the 95 out of 100 times that I tap on this stupid screen, a whole bunch, you will find those dots happening inside that shape. 5% of the time, whoops. Another 5% of the time. It is a probability shape. It is not a hard, fast line. So if you think back to what we tell elementary kids to do, which you may have already done, building atoms, mobiles, where you have all the electrons as pennies glued on to lines, circles around an atom, complete and utter nonsense. Okay? The electron is not following in a circle. It's randomly jumping around. It can be randomly found within that probability sphere. That is your 95% probability. You don't like that? Sort of tough. Memorize it. The s orbital is a sphere. p orbital is a dumbbell. D orbital is cloverleaf, plus the donut. <coughs> Got a little donut in the middle. Let me know where it's going. So orbital capacities. In the first energy level, how many electrons fit in this energy level? Two. Two. Why? What type of orbitals do we have? We have the sphere with one orientation, which means one orbital. Each orbital holds two electrons. Second energy level, how many electrons? Where did you come up with six? No, change your answer now. You're not allowed to. Why did you say six? Six, because that's how much the second thing holds. If we think to our second energy level, we see the p orbitals. And our p orbitals have... Six. But you'd be wrong because our second energy level is not just p orbitals, it is also the 2s. The 2s can hold two electrons. The 2p can hold six. The total electrons for that energy level? Eight. What happens if we move to the third energy level? How many electrons? We have the 2s, that's an s, 2p. And, sorry, I gave you a hard time for counting to 14. <laughs> you at least made it past 2. 3s, 3p, 3d. How many electrons in the 3s? 2. How many electrons in the 3p? How many electrons in the 3d? 10. Gets us a total of 18 electrons in that energy level. Okay. For those of you going, okay, well, I'm going to memorize. There's two electrons in the S, six in the P. Again, periodic table. You don't need to memorize it. Count the columns. Okay. I don't know where you messed up counting up to 14, but most of the time we're counting less than 14. Okay. So you should be able to count off the periodic table how many electrons go into each of those orbitals. Okay. <clears throat> electrons are added into our orbital home's lowest energy first, and then we are paired before finding a higher energy home. 
okay? Not just new orbital. So higher energy. Okay. We could go through and draw out a diagram like this to go through and determine our filling pattern for every single element. Okay. And you'll notice that when we looked at our filling patterns, we stopped, actually I stopped probably at fluorine. We didn't look at how to put all the electrons in beyond fluorine. Why? because it doesn't go numerically through the entire periodic table. Okay. You will notice that your textbook references something known as a filling diagram for your electron configurations. Okay. So what we can do is start with our lowest energy, very similar to what we had on the previous slide, right? 1s, 2s with 2p, 3s with 3p, 3d. And as far as deciding our filling, okay, I don't know how to sew, but this looks kind of like sewing. We go through one piece of the fabric, through our 1s, we double back through. We go back on our diagonal to our 2s, we double back through, 2p, 3s. Okay. Why does this get interesting? Well, if we go through and fill this, 1s, then 2s, then 2p, right? Then 3s. Well, that makes sense. It's going in perfect order, right? Then 3p, and then... 4s. Why did we skip the 3d? Good question. What starts to happen as we go up higher in energy? The orbitals all get closer and closer to energy, which then means their filling pattern starts to change. That filling pattern comes down to something known very simply as symmetry. Think of the most attractive person you are aware of. Cover up half of their face. Look at it. Cover up the other half of your, their, their face, or your face if you're, I, mean, I guess, narcissistic. <laughs> and what will you find? <laughs> Good call. There's symmetry. When you look at an attractive person, they are symmetric across the middle axis. If they are unsymmetric, we tend to think of them as ugly or unattractive. Okay? Same thing is happening when we fill orbitals. We will reach a point where the energy levels are so similar to each other that we now start to factor in symmetry into the filling pattern. That symmetry, you can try to reason your way through or you just have it straight up memorized. There it is. Or, best part, look at the periodic table. Our issue, when we switched, we went from the 3P to the 4S instead of the 3D. And we go, oh, that doesn't make any sense. You know, periodic table must have screwed up. Find my last 3P element. 3P what? Argon. Six, argon. Add one more electron. It would become element 19. Potassium, which is found in the fourth energy level and the S block. The next electron after the 3P goes into the 4S. The next electron goes into the 4S. The next electron goes into the our D block. What energy level is it? 3D. Why is that one weird? The scandium is our 3D, and it's located in the fourth row. Your D orbitals are offset from the table by one. Why? Because we're trying to include on the periodic table how we draw the electron configurations so we don't have to memorize this nonsense. Again, periodic table, <laughs> nonsense. Okay. We'll pick up there with electron configurations next week.